You may be seated. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 18, continuing our series through Ephesians. This morning we come to chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Everybody loves Ephesians 2. If you tell them you're speaking on Ephesians 2, they say, oh, I love Ephesians 2. But usually they mean verses 1 through 10 of Ephesians 2. You tell them you're speaking on uh, verse 11 and following, they say, I didn't even know there was a verse 11 and following, but there is. Uh, This second half of Ephesians tells us more about the work and power of God's grace in his church. So let's hear God's Holy Word, Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do ask that you would bless us now as we hear your word that You would speak to us through our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless us by your Spirit, that we would hear all that it is that you have for us today, that we'd be encouraged uh, by the work of your grace in your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you visit the official John Lennon website, you can find on that website a picture Uh, of that famous beetle seated at a white baby grand piano. It's a kind of iconic picture because it's the piano that John Lennon played for his famous song, Imagine. Maybe you remember some of the words from that song. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion, too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. I think that Lenin captured well uh, the secular vision of Western society at the end of the 20th century in that famous song. Uh, He thought we could achieve this. We haven't. But he thought we could. It would only require the end of religion. Then we could all be one. And you know, that really is one of the great triumphs of the devil, that He has convinced people that the only answer to the problem of our hostility is actually the problem itself. If only you would stop with all of that Jesus, then peace would come. But Jesus is not the problem. Jesus is the solution. In fact, Paul says here he is the only solution to a world that is at enmity with one another. And nowhere was this seen more powerfully or beautifully than in the early church as people vastly different from one another were brought together as one. Kent Hughes writes about this. He says, uh, there are no modern social divisions so unrelenting as the separation of Jew and Gentile in biblical times. None of our racial barriers or narrow nationalisms or iron curtains are are greater than that hostility that existed between Jew and Gentile in Paul's day. Uh, Jews believed that Gentiles were, quote, created to fuel the fires of hell. Uh, It was not lawful for a Jew to help a Gentile woman in giving birth to a child because that would bring another Gentile into the world. And the Jews hated, uh, the Gentiles hated the Jews as well. 
And they hated one another. Uh, Gentiles had many subdivisions, and they all hated one another also. That would include Romans and Greeks and Scythians and barbarians, just to mention a few of the ones that Paul himself mentions in his letters. But in these verses here, in the second half of Ephesians 2, Paul is telling us one of the ways that God shows the power of his grace. And this is how he does it. That people who outside of the church could never get along with one another can now get along with one another in the church. This is part of the power of the gospel. Sinclair Ferguson writes, Here Paul shows us how God's grace looks in a community. God's grace breaks down walls. It breaks down barriers between peoples. It binds us together in a way that is more powerful than any other association in the world. We are one in Christ. That's Paul's message here, and this is a gospel message that we need very badly. Wouldn't you agree that this is a message we need? Wouldn't you agree that this is a message the world is in desperate need of as well? We need this passage. In particular, we need this passage because the world wants peace. The world wants an end to the hostility, but it is looking for it in all of the wrong places. What we need is Christ, and what Christ alone is able to give. Now, as Paul makes that point to the Ephesian church, he is speaking largely to Gentiles. And so he's speaking to almost every one of us who is here this morning as well. And what he says is that the first thing you need to recognize is, is the alienation that once existed between you and God as a Gentile. Look at verses 11 and 12. Paul writes there, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember what you were at that time. Now, Paul here uses this term, the uncircumcision, and that was a derogatory term used by the Jews about the Gentiles. It is a sad thing that the Jews took a very good gift from God, circumcision, something that showed that they belonged to God, and they used it to look down in pride on everyone else. Now, Paul demolishes that in other places. But here, he is telling the Gentiles, remember, you were far from God, very far from God. And they need to remember this. Paul says, remember, two times in verse 11 and verse 12. Remember that you were far away from God. And Paul tells them why. First of all, they were far away from God because they were separate from Christ. Separate from Christ. Now, Christ is just the word for Messiah. God's only chosen, anointed king. And God's chosen people, Israel, were waiting for the Messiah, for the anointed king to come and to take his throne. And all throughout their history, from Genesis 3 onward, they were waiting with expectation for this. And that was a great encouragement to God's people. It filled them with hope. Their whole life was one of longing for the Christ to come, for that better day that was coming in him. But you see, the Gentiles, they had no such longing, no such Christ to look forward to. They had no hope of God intruding into history with salvation in the future. They were separate from Christ. Secondly, Paul says that they were far away from God because they were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise. This is related to the first thing, uh, but Paul is saying it in, in more ways here. Israel was a nation. They were a set-apart nation, a theocracy that God had bound to himself with particular covenant promises. Jews were citizens of that nation, but Gentiles were not. They didn't have the benefits of it. They had no place among God's people. Third of all, Paul says that they were far away from God because they were without hope and without God 
in the world. Can you imagine a darker and more devastating epithet for your life without God and without hope in the world? Now, the Jews, Israel, knew God. They did know God. They knew that God was with them. They knew that God cared for them. They had God's word. The prophets spoke God's word to them. They had the psalms by which God gave them words to pray and sing to him with words of lament and hope and joy and concern. But the Gentiles had no such thing. I mean, they had their gods, but they were false gods. They were dead. They could do nothing. They did not have the living and true God with them. And Paul is saying here, remember that that is who you once were. You were separate from Christ, excluded from God's people. You were without hope and without God in the world. And weren't we in the same place before we had Christ? especially those of us who grew out outside of the church, outside of the covenant people of God. Not only were we dead in our sins, but we were far away. We were separate from Christ. We weren't hearing his word. Uh, we were without God. I mean, of course, we had gods. We made gods of the things of this world and its pleasures, but it left us hopeless, without hope and without God in the world. And Paul's saying, Remember who you were. Don't forget that that's who you were outside of Christ. Well, why is it that we need to remember that? Because remembering our alienation from God before we were in Christ accentuates the joy and peace that is ours now that we have God in Christ. So remember, he says. Remember the alienation that once existed between you and God. And that will, that will give you great joy in the peace you now have. That's what Paul goes on to talk about next of all, the peace that has come. Look at verse 13. Paul says there, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. But now, Paul says. That should sound kind of familiar because... But God was the turning point of verses 1 through 10. You were dead, but God made you alive in Christ Jesus. He does the same thing here. You were far off, but now God has brought you near by the blood of Christ. Now that language of being brought near by blood, that is, that is the language of the Old Testament temple and its sacrifices, being brought near by blood. In the Old Testament times, God commanded his people uh, to confess their sins over an animal and, uh, and then to kill it. It was a bloody thing. And it said to them, this is what you deserve. You deserve to die. But this animal has borne it in your place. Now, that could never fully take away their sins. The New Testament tells us the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove our sins forever. That's why they had to keep on doing it over and over again until Christ came. Because his blood is once and for all. Through his death, he has opened up a new and living way into the presence of God and brought to an end all of those Old Testament sacrifices because he's brought us near to God permanently. How does Paul say it here? He has torn down the dividing wall of hostility. The dividing wall of hostility. Some of you here, just a few of you, those of you who are older than me, uh, remember growing up under the metaphorical shadow of the Berlin Wall, a great wall separating East and West Germany, and people greatly hostile to one another. More of us here remember in 1987 when President Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I remember hearing that and thinking, this guy is fantastic. I, what, what a great guy. And then in 1990, the demolition began and the gates were open. It's an enormous barrier torn down. But the wall that Christ has torn down is even more significant than that. It is far more significant that, than that. This dividing wall of hostility takes us back into the temple in Jerusalem in the first century. There in the temple, there was 
a dividing wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from uh, the courts where the Jews could be. God-fearing Gentiles could come into that one court, but they could not get in as close as the Jewish people could. And in fact, there were inscriptions on those walls uh, that read uh, this way. We know this because they've been found. They're in museums now. They said, no foreigner or Gentile may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary. Anyone who is caught doing so will have only himself to blame for his ensuing death. Okay. They didn't say trespassers will be prosecuted. They said trespassers will be executed. This was a dividing wall of hostility. And Paul says Christ has torn that wall down through his death so that now all people, Jew and Gentile alike, have access to God in the same way through the blood of Christ and they enjoy spiritual unity with one another. Now, how did Christ do this? How did Christ's death break down that dividing wall? Paul tells us three ways. First of all, Christ tore down that wall by abolishing the law. Verse 15, he says, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, how did Christ tear down the law or abolish the law when in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus specifically said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, the answer is that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about the moral law, the Ten Commandments. He did not abolish that. He fulfilled it. He removed the condemnation of it on us, but he still calls us to obey it. What Christ has abolished is the ceremonial law. All of those hundreds and hundreds of laws from the Old Testament about the various washings and the dietary laws and all of the sacrificial system. Christ fulfilled all of that and now he has abolished it through his death. And those ordinances were a very real barrier between Jew and Gentile. But it's gone now. Sinclair Ferguson writes, the temporary arrangements of the Mosaic system are now seen to have been, like the tabernacle in the wilderness, collapsible. You remember? The tabernacle was collapsible. So also with those, those ceremonial laws. In Christ, God has come not only to pack it up, but to pack it away permanently. And what is the result of that? That's what Paul's saying here. It's that both Jew and Gentile now are, are given access in the same exact way, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. The, the dividing wall has been torn down. The second thing that Paul says here is that Christ broke down that wall by creating a new humanity. A new humanity. Verse 15 goes on to say, And he created in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace. One new man can be translated one new humanity. That is a very strong statement there. People from vastly different backgrounds brought together in one new humanity. Early church writers called the Christian church the third race. It is a new people brought together. You know, it's one thing to be in a club. Maybe you're in a club, like a tennis club or a chess club, if you're really nerdy. You know, and you, you have one thing in common with the people in that club. But um, when you share an ethnicity or a culture with people, that is way more significant because it affects almost everything in your life. But you know what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying when you become a Christian, that new identity transcends, transcends even your ethnicity. And so, so you are English or Italian or German or Chinese or Taiwanese or Irish or Australian or Puerto Rican or Mexican or Brazilian or Eritrean or Korean, just to name some of the ethnicities we have here in our own church. And that's a good thing. But when you become a Christian, Christ makes that the most significant thing about your identity. You still have your ethnicity. You can enjoy it. You can be proud of it. 
I'm a Pennsylvanian. That's my ethnicity. Uh, Pennsylvania is the only place in America where they don't speak English with an accent. Um, <laughs> Except for Western PA, they speak kind of funny out there. So, you know, you can be proud of your ethnicity. You can enjoy where you are from. But in Christ, Paul is saying, there is a stronger bond between us than, than you can find anywhere else in this world. I remember hearing a story about uh, a, uh, a very educated Christian man. He, he was a very elite professor at a very elite university, very cultured man, and one day he was driving to an event with uh, a bunch of his fellow professors, and uh, it was going to be a very high culture event. You, they were going to be drinking sherry at the event and rubbing shoulders and talking about PhDs and their latest books and things like that. They were culturally just like him, but they were not Christians. And on his way driving there, he turned on the radio and he heard on the radio Brother Bob preaching hellfire and gospel grace. And uh, as he listened to Brother Bob preach, at first he was kind of turned off by what he heard. He was very different from him. His grammar was wrong. He was making kind of silly arguments. But then suddenly it occurred to him, this man is my brother. I have more in common with him than any of the people I am going to be with at this party. Christ creates a new humanity of people who are very, very different in every other way, but in the most important way, they are exactly the same. The third thing that Paul says here about how Christ destroyed the dividing wall of hostility is he says, that Christ reconciled this new humanity to God. He says that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That's verse 16. This is the gospel that Jesus killed through his own death, in his body on the cross, he killed the hostility between Jew and Gentile. Why? Because ultimately, he killed the hostility between both Jews and Gentiles and God. That's the ultimate hostility that is in play here. That all people, whatever nation or tribe or ethnicity, are at enmity with God. And that enmity with God is the source of the enmity that they have with one another. And being reconciled with God is the source of their reconciliation with one another. It's not the other way around. It is vertical reconciliation that produces the horizontal. For example, that is why when the Apostle Peter was refusing to eat with Gentiles, you remember that scene? That was a very bad thing for him to do, refusing to eat with Gentiles. What did the Apostle Paul come to him and say? He said, you are not living in line with the gospel. He didn't say, here's something else for you to do. He said, this is what's been done. This is who you are in Christ. If you are reconciled with God in Christ, then you are reconciled with all who are in Christ as well. It flows from the gospel. So you can think about people in the early church who were radically different from one another. Let's do a quick interview with two of them. Take Nicodemus, the Sadducee, and the Samaritan woman at the well. Couldn't be more different from each other. All right, let's interview them. Nicodemus, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, you are a religious man, right? Yes. Well-schooled in the law? Absolutely. So you would say you are near to God, Nicodemus. Yes, I am. So then why did you come to Jesus in the dark of night and ask him all of those questions? Well, that's because I realized that even though I was near, I actually was very far away. Okay, thank you. Um, you, over there, lady from Samaria, you, you're part of the far away folks, right? Yes, the far away folks. I had five husbands and a live-in lover, and Jesus told me all about it. Okay, so you were far away? Yes, I was as far away as I could be. Where are you now? Now I'm near to God. Actually, Nicodemus and I are both near to God together. In fact, we go to the same church. We go to Jesus Light of the Nations, OPC. <laughs> and we have the same favorite song. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was far off, but now I'm near, was blind, but now I see. Can you imagine those two people being told that because of their backgrounds, they still had to be reconciled to one another? They say, we are reconciled to, God, to one another because we are reconciled to God in Christ. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying Jew and Gentile, Scythian and barbarian, Roman and Greek, black and white. If we are in Christ, we cannot get more reconciled to one another than we are in Christ. And I want you to notice this here because this is so important. The peace that we have that Paul is talking about here is, first of all, vertical peace with God. Peace with God is ours through the shedding of Christ's blood to reconcile us to God. And we were united to one another only because we are united to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying in verses 17 and 18. He says, And Christ came, and he preached peace to you who were far off, and he preached peace to you who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Christ is the peacemaker. Of course he is. Of course he is the peacemaker. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, promised in Isaiah 9, verse 6. In fact, he is the one Isaiah prophesied of in Isaiah 57, verse 19, that the Messiah would come and preach peace to those who were far and preach peace to those who were near. And so throughout his whole ministry, peace is, is a signal benefit. On the, on the eve of his birth, when he came and took on our flesh, the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is well pleased. On the eve of his death, Jesus said, My peace I leave you, and my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace, do I give peace to you. On the day of his resurrection, he came to his disciples through those locked doors, and the very first word that he spoke to them was, Peace be to you. Where there was hostility, Jesus has brought peace. And he's done so in the most important place. While we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us. That is the hostility that Jesus bore. He bore that holy, heavenly hostility that we deserved because we were enemies with God. And so now he himself is our peace. Paul says that emphatically. He himself, not just he is our peace, but he himself is our peace. Sinclair Ferguson says, Paul is saying here that peace is not an extra commodity given to us by Christ. It's not something we go out and do. It is a reality that is experienced in and through Jesus Christ as we all have access to God in one spirit, to the Father. You see, you see the triune nature of that, God, the Son, Father, and Spirit, all mentioned there. When we are in contact with the triune God, we have peace with everyone who is in contact with the triune God. That is the marvelous work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if this is what Christ has done, what will it look like in our lives? What does it look like to live as the church made one? Well, for one thing, it means we should draw near to God because that is, a great, uh, that is the great gospel that has come to us that you are not separated from God. There is no hostility there. There is no warfare between you and God if you are in Jesus Christ. And so you can run to him. No guilt or shame should keep your head low. You can go through the new and living way that Christ has opened up to God the Father in the Spirit. Draw near to God. But then second of all, draw near to God together with your brothers and sisters from every culture and nation and language and tribe and tongue because that is the effect of the gospel as he has made us one in Christ. And it's a beautiful thing to experience. 
Years ago, Jen and I visited China for one of the happiest experiences of our lives. Uh, but we definitely realized when we were there that we were not in Pennsylvania anymore. Uh, we're both from Pennsylvania, and we were away from home. Uh, we had a guide while we were there, and that helped a lot. But, uh, but you know, even he said, make sure you, you never uh, leave your visa behind. Take it with you at all times. We really felt our foreignness while we were there. And you would think that we did not feel at home again until our plane touched down at Newark International Airport. And in one sense, we didn't, except for one wonderful experience. On a hot Sunday, August morning in Guangzhou, China, we crammed into a church building in Center City with 500 brave brothers and sisters in Christ with no air conditioning and pews tighter than I have ever seen them in my life, and we worshiped God with them. And we knew at that moment we are home. These are my people. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. We listened to a sermon in Chinese and sang songs in Chinese, but we knew we were with family. And isn't it a privilege to be a part of a church that has a taste of that in small part? A taste of that heavenly ethnic diversity? I mean, we want more of it. We would love to have more of it. But God has given much to us. And what is it that makes it so wonderful? It's that it's a foretaste of heaven. On that day when we will gather near to our God of grace with our blood-bought brothers and sisters from every nation and tribe and tongue, and we will all draw near for the exact same reason, because we are covered in the blood of Jesus the Lamb. And so we ought to do that now. We ought to pursue it now. And I say pursue it because it's, it's not easy. It's a challenge. You, you have to work at it. But we should enjoy it because it is a taste of heaven. And one last thing as we close this morning. Since this is Jesus' work in his church to make his church one, we ought to be a church that is praying that we would be a light to the world of the peace that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Because as his church, we are an embassy here an embassy of heaven on earth. That's what the church is. An embassy of heaven on earth, showing to the world what the true society looks like, what the new humanity looks like, what the real peace looks like that they long for but they cannot find. This is the peace that Paul's talking about here in this passage. It's the peace that's found in the church, not in the world. And that means as the church we have an immense responsibility to be a pocket of peace for the world to see, to be an embassy of reconciliation and of brothers and sisters drawn near from vastly different backgrounds so that the world cannot help but look on and say, that is exactly what we need. That is exactly what we are longing for. How do you live at peace with those who are so different from you? And we will say, ah, it is because we have been given peace with our God through Jesus Christ. And he has given us peace with one another in him. Imagine. Imagine all the people in this new humanity living at peace. That's the church and it's found in Christ alone. May we pursue it and enjoy it as the gift of God's grace in Christ, who by his blood has made us one. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that we have access to you through the blood of Christ, and as we, as we draw near, we look side to side, and we see those from every nation and tribe and tongue who have been bought by that same blood. Would you would you work in our midst that we would pursue this with intentionality and joy uh, as the people who have been won by that blood? And may it honor you, the God who has made us one, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's sing together hymn 403.